today with michael <sighs> michael how you doing uh, you know. look a little little worn down from those movies man <laughs> um we're gonna talk about ladies on the show today michael yeah Doesn't okay that make you let's excited? put it that way what are the movies we're, we're doing the conduit by which we're <laughs> talking about ladies irreversible uh-huh. and the woman two children's films about no <laughs> irreversible and the woman that's this is heavy already I don't so we're gonna spoil them even though irreversible does a wonderful job of spoiling itself right off the bat if you don't like spoilers, you can fucking chapter. And I guess that brings us to New French Extremism. This is a movie that, as you were invoking, uh, goes backwards. And it, it fucking commits to that because it starts with the end credits. Yeah. Way to go. Just Irrevers- the whole fucking thing, too. Yeah. Well, Irreversible. So we did uh, Memento very early on yeah. in Double Featuredom. That was in the uh, the year that shall not be listened to by human ears. Right. Uh, that was what, what do we call that? Year not? That's year zero of a uh, double, year zero of double feature would be better than that. So Irreversible, it's a film in reverse chronology. And I dare say, Eric Ingram, it uh-huh. is the single best use of reverse chronology I've ever seen in ever. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons that the reverse chronology is, I mean, this is, this is the ultimate in this experiment. Yeah. It's how this, many things can you accomplish with this? Sure. How much can you justify telling that this story is nothing forwards and everything it's backwards? absolutely true. So Gaspar No did this, and we haven't talked about him except I did uh, mention that I loved this placebo video, probably randomly, right. somewhere on the show. It is a single take video of somebody wandering around an orgy. You'll see that this director uh, has a couple let's say, conventions that he likes to stick to. Uh Free-floating, single camera, just wandering around an orgy, and that is the placebo video. Kind of like the beginning of Irreversible. Yeah, it just wanders aimlessly. uh, It watches a lot of people masturbate, which I guess also kind of happens. And it might as well have been a clip from from this movie. And it's an amazing video. It's a really great video. Yep. He also did Enter the Void. Of which which I've seen the title sequence. You know, that's my favorite part, let's say, of uh, Enter the Void. Enter the Void goes even further with this camera work. It's uh, it's about three hours long and entirely one single take. So when you say it's about three hours long, you're not exaggerating. No, I'm really not exaggerating. Okay. The original release of this, his version of the film, is three hours long. Uh, it's not actually a single. I mean, nothing's actually a, a single right. take. Well, so we have this disorienting camera work in the beginning of this movie. Mm-hmm. It's the fly on the wall. I mean, almost literally fly on the wall. The camera is just buzzing around well, the yeah, fucking and, room. And it's, this is the kind of fly on the wall where you're mad that the fly is sitting in the wrong fucking room. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> right. This fly is not apparently you not wish, aware of the plot of the film. <laughs> you wish the fly had some direction? Yeah. You know, we covered that idea a ton when we talked about the Adam Rifkin movie, when we talked about Look. Mm-hmm. That was just, hey, here's this concept. What does this do? Sure. I mean, Look is voyeurism. This yeah. is basically voyeurism. Sure. In a creepy way. In a creek, because voyeurism is usually in a happy, friendly way. Uh, today, you know, in a voyeurism way. tends to be in a harmless way, but add a fire extinguisher and a face. Oh God! Well, there's certainly uh, more of a sense that you're there watching it. That's one thing it accomplishes. I think Gasper uh, really relies on it accomplishing the surreal, dreamlike feel to his movies. That's sort of what they're known for. And when Irreversible came out. It was pretty new, and myself being new to the director, this being you know his biggest film to come out up to that point, hadn't seen that technique really before, and then is later exploited you know for the three hours in Enter the Void, even to a, a further extent. His camera work, he plays with a lot of these um, different techniques, and I think that's where his notability really is as a director. Uh, aside from the ideas like you know doing your film backwards or these very very conceptual pieces. There's that scene before they get in, uh, I think it's right before they get in the taxi. Uh They're talking to the transvestite. Sure. And they're walking backwards, you know, camera's walking backwards down the alley, following them, zooming in. Takes a step backwards, zooms back in. Right. He kind of shoots with this enthusiasm, like someone who's just got their first camera, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're 
oh, look, I can zoom and now I can zoom pull back is, and I, I mean, can zoom again. Zoom is either a novice choice or a very ballsy cinematic decision. That's where Gasper uh, resides yeah. <laughs> for me. Just always walking, uh, walking that line. But I mean, wherever someone falls on that, you can't knock that enthusiasm, that playfulness, just seeing him go... I have a camera. Cameras are fun. Ooh, look at the camera. Go- sure. You know, doing that thing where the camera flies around through the yeah. air all crazy. That's not an easy thing to no. do. That's not, well, I don't want to get a tripod. I'll just run around with my camera. Yeah. Fuck you. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it takes a lot of thought to yeah. make it look like it took no thought. Well, it's a level of self-indulgence that you really have to be careful with. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of French film in general mm-hmm. is this idea of self-indulgence. Um, Jean-Pierre Jeunet. One sure. of the French kings of self-indulgence. Sure. It's what makes French film what people think of French film. And something like Irreversible, it's so intricately woven into this story and the style and the fact that nothing feels okay. Sure. When you do something self-indulgent in a cinematic situation where everything is jarring and you're uncomfortable the whole time, self-indulgence takes a tone that puts you on edge even more and right. it makes you angry because... You're you're looking at a situation like this and, you know, you see a film dealing with this brutal rape and this whole storyline and you sit there going, how do you have the balls to just zoom your camera and sure, pay attention? Sure. Do you know what's at stake here? <laughs> right. Have you seen what's gone on? Sure, sure. Well, and then even the way that it's written, it's this, uh, you know, the tapeworm scene, the uh, the scene where they're at the rectum. Right. They're trying to get answers, and everyone is making jokes about the rectum. Sure. I mean, that entire scene is simultaneously the pivotal moment where I need to get answers, but also every have you seen the tapeworm is a fucking joke about the name tapeworm and rectum. Sure. Well, and furthermore, talk about the scene where you need answers. Imagine putting that scene as the first scene in your sure. film yeah. where you just don't even know what answers you're looking for because yeah. you're not sure what's going on. I mean, for me at this point, the first time watching the film, I didn't even know it was reverse chronological order. Oh yeah. I'm thinking this is how the film opens. This is the beginning of the storyline. Sure. And this scene comes back in your mind every time. The film jumps back. Yeah. Every time they cut to one scene before, sure. you can take or leave what happened in the previous scene, you know, barring the horrible, horrendous rape. Yeah. But you always go back to, I know this ends at the rectum. Right. And eventually you get to the point where you realize that the scene at the rectum was a waste of time. Yeah, sure. And that is the most, I mean, when I think irreversible, honestly, what it is to me is this reverse chronological story where you see what you're so sure is the sure. final payoff and the revenge moment sure only to halfway through the film in the most emotionally trying point of the film to realize that the horrible guy gets away yeah and that there's nothing you can do that that the film That's will continue happened. going backwards in mm-hmm. time and that there is never going to be a moment where that guy gets his just desserts yeah really you can only get more wrong yeah, as the it's, as the movie progresses it's, it's that's what i mean when i say that this film's reverse chronology is the strongest because by the time you realize that the end of the film was the wrong thing sure to have it's the wrong outcome right yeah. it's it's not the goal of the driving characters sure you can't go forward in time anymore sure. you always think when you watch a film i wish i could go back yeah. And do it differently. And this this is the first time I've ever watched a film right. and wished I wish I could go forward. Yeah. You know, I wish just I could go get forward to and do it and the right it. way. Yeah, right. Well, it takes a while to get your bearings. I yeah. mean, the film purposefully disorients you sure. in the beginning with the camera work. It has these two it starts on two guys that have nothing to do with the fucking right. movie kind of talking about their philosophy that'll that'll be, you know, the greater uh setting up the context, yeah. I guess, for the narrative. And then you know, you can't get any goddamn answers because when some guy is shouting, fist me, fist me, it's hard to get any fucking work done. Right. So you're upset. You're thrown off. You hate that you can't find answers. You don't know what anybody's talking about. And then, as you pointed out earlier, there's the brutal scene of the fire extinguisher. Uh, it goes back to some of the interesting camera stuff. There's, you know, that camera just rears back with every blow. Right. And then jolts forward and stops, dead fucking stop, like it hits a, a brick wall every time. The other thing that the film doesn't do that a lot of films would do, especially outside of the French extremism movement, mm-hmm. is it just shows the guy's face getting yeah. 
destroyed by the fire extinguisher. It It doesn't pull away. It doesn't hide it in shadow. You watch his upper jaw start overtaking his nose every time he gets hit. Yeah. And it's horrible. And it's kind of this moment where don't show the monster becomes show the monster because the monster is the worst. Yeah, it's brutal. And it's brutal enough that everyone stops jacking off. That's how you know it got serious. Sure. Even the director, a French filmmaker, stops jerking himself off. He's beating it in his own movie. I mean, it's unfair because the the French sampling we have on the show is self-selected. Sure. So we just pick the French movies where people beat off. Yeah, well, and, and I don't want to come off as, as trying to mock French film for being self-indulgent. I think that's one of the glorious things about French filmmakers is their sure. ability and dedication to indulging themselves in film. Or at least the ones we found. Well, and that goes with everything. I haven't seen enough movies to know anything about shit, so whatever. <laughs> right. So we don't get our bearings for a while, and as we're figuring out what the fuck, and you're finally going, oh, backwards, yes. <laughs> you know, you kind of find out who Alex is. We're introduced to her. Right. We find out she's in the hospital, and we get that reveal that the man we killed probably has, guy. is looking more and more like he has nothing to do with this. Mm. And you only realize that when you stop to consider it, because like you said you're dizzy for a little while and you keep trying to go back to that first scene and say, well, wait a second. We wind up here. How does this, you know, how do these pieces how does this play, play into the final act? Sure. When your mind is so used to the linear narrative, you know, you look forward and irreversible kind of uses that to make you think back to previous scenes to reconsider the story, given your new evidence, literally every single scene you're going, all right, so I've got some clues now this scene is stopped. We're moving to the next scene. You almost want to pause there, get out the notepad and kind of film noir your way back through it. Go, all right, what do we know about our case now that I've got these additional clues? That also makes every single scene change things both forwards and backwards because of the the chronology of the movie. But it still works like a classic narrative does. I mean, you're still shown Alex. She doesn't show up right in the beginning. You hear about her, and then you find out about her. So they're answering these little mysteries kind of as the film itself right. moves forward. First of all, you find out she's not a dude because they're <laughs> going to gay clubs and talking about fisting sure. a lot in the, well, hey, way to go talking about that much fisting there's in a the lot. I mean, your movie. There's a lot of commentary on homosexuality, and I mean, there's sure. a lot of commentary on homophobia, too. Yeah, I mean, that's those two characters. You kind of wonder about them. Sure. You, they're not redeemable characters in the beginning of this movie. Right. Well, and you get this, you get this, I mean, the conversation with the two older guys mm-hmm. has a lot to do with homophobia. The yeah. most obvious scene is when... Uh, The guy's getting wheeled out of the rectum. Sure. And all these people are shouting these, you know, fucking gay asshole. I hope they made your asshole bleed. You're going to, you know, you got AIDS or whatever. And the film deals a lot with homophobia, which is interesting because it has so little to do (laughs) with homophobia. But I think that that is, it's another. uh, It's a deliberate choice, you think? Exactly. I think it's a deliberate choice to mislead and kind of. Make you think this film is going to be uh, offensive and difficult sure. for all the wrong reasons. Well, and also to make you kind of start to to hate your characters right away. Sure. Even though, you know, you project that homophobia onto them, even if they don't necessarily deserve it. Right. I mean, in a linear fashion, these guys just had the worst goddamn thing ever happen to them. You don't really feel like they're terrible people by the time you get to the sure. end of the movie. But you see them doing all these things. I mean, I think they can safely be excused of any kind of homophobic slurs they make just because the worst thing ever just happened. They're mad. They find out the guy's at a gay club. And so they hate every single gay person on the planet. I mean, it's it's this brilliant choice where, again, from a chronological standpoint, if you were to watch the film in chronological order, Mm -hmm. by the time they get to the gay club, the fact that they're shouting faggot and hating on all these gay people it would you wouldn't even notice it yeah. wouldn't even come off as jarring or homophobic because you would know the characters by then you would have already made your decisions sure. on who they are sure. as human beings right and they would walk into the club fired up having gone through hell ready for you know the fucking devil himself sure, sure. and something like a homophobic comment would just come off as trash talk where the first thing in the film being this homophobic stuff kind of gives you a glimpse at how off the handle Yep. They really are. You never yep. realize this in in a normal film where in a revenge film, right? You never see the end where you watch the character who's been pushed to the limit sure. 
before you know who they are. Sure. It's like walking in in the last scene of a revenge film, right. looking at the protagonist and going, wow, what an asshole. You just don't get it. So there's one other big thing that the reverse chronology, I think, does. Mm-hmm. There's the crux, the, the center point of the film, which is the rape. And everything before that should, in theory, feel more okay because yeah. no one's been raped. No one's killing anybody. Sure, sure. But instead, you have these characters being assholes to each other and you're literally watching their time together tick down. Yeah. And anytime someone's mean to anybody, that's just you're watching the impermanence sure. of these joyous situations. You're talking about end of the film, beginning of the chronology. Right. Getting to know these characters, their philosophies. Seeing them have fun, but then also going, you're right, every little moment that they're not doing the best thing yeah, ever it, is just, a waste of time. Exactly. You watch, I mean, you get back to them in bed and yeah. you want them so badly to just stay in bed yeah. and just cherish this sure. because really by the end of the day, this is the last good thing you will ever know. Sure. And it's it's amazing that a film can start with this horrible murder sure, end with this wonderful moment of two people in bed and you want them you're you're like horrified yeah. that they're sitting in this bed and you just you know you're watching them and you know what happens to them and it it's 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 just as effective as the murder at the end being sure. at the end of the film because you still you still you know the murder is coming yeah the murder is still the outcome of yeah, the film. right well and then every single time the scene ends it feels like you're extinguishing that moment right you're done with that that's you know right and i hope you cherish that because now we're leaping back even further and the time's just it's counting down yeah it's amazing that you can take such a lovely moment that at the beginning of the film would feel really nice and happy and instead you look at it through the lens of the end you know yeah, the chronology it gives you anxiety <laughs> and it's everything becomes terrible yeah. because you know what's going to happen well it also keeps us engaged because we're looking for foreshadowing you know towards the beginning as we're searching around for clues the uh the sort of irony of use the tunnel you know avoid yeah. danger you should take the tunnel i mean that's lost on no one everybody knows sure. what's coming we see monica belushi's character and we go oh she's alive oh Oh, that means that this is this scene. Yeah. That's about to, oh, I'm not ready for this. You know, we know how it wraps up. That rape scene is the, first of all, it's the first time the camera sits still and in the whole goddamn movie. Forever. Yeah, it feels I like know. it sits still forever. Well, and that's part of uh, what's great about having used the same mechanism throughout the movie is that you know, not only am I going to sit here for a while in this scene, I'm going to see the totality of it. Mm -hmm. This scene is not going to end until everything is done. And, you know, when you see her alive, you start going to, well, how is this scene going to end? And the fact it kind of takes its time getting there, you know, the camera uh, lands in that, that perfectly framed shot of the red hallway, you know, the, the infamous shot that's used for the movie. And sometimes we talk about, contrast in a movie and that making different parts more effective Mm -hmm. you know the the history of violence kind of pacing and then brutality and why those those brutal moments were so effective you know the the contrast in this case we know that the camera is not going to cut and that the scene won't end uh until i mean not only is there the rape going on but she winds up in a coma so unless she's raped into coma there's going to be a little bit of brutality in there too sure And, you know, until it gets to that moment, we're just going, it's getting worse and worse, and it still has to get a lot worse before this ends. The fact that this isn't in stark contrast, that this is the same, we're going to stick with this scene, we're going to watch things play out uh, to their conclusion, that actually makes this worse because we know what we're in for. I guess if, uh, if the rest of the way you do your movie is brutal enough and you've committed to that, then when something really, really terrible goes on in the in the frame, you got to stick with that. It makes you feel more awful before the scene's even over. It's this kind of uh, fucked up promise the movie has made yeah. you. The best thing, I think, and something that's already come up a little bit through our conversation, if you were to consider, all right, these two guys, this is a, if you go, this is a revenge film, this is a terrible revenge film. Mm-hmm. It's a bad revenge film in the typical sense, in the, the classical narrative sense, because, you know, you see something traumatic happen to a character and then they get the payoff, they get retribution, they kill every last motherfucking one of them. That's a revenge film. And so by starting with the revenge, 
And then even, I mean, even when you don't consider the fact it's the wrong guy, that's kind of icing on the cake here. Right. But even if they killed the right guy, you do that in the beginning and you see how, wow, that changes everything. Sure. You know, the movie's trying to fail as a revenge film. Right. It doesn't well, want to be a glorious... Them as vicious killers right off the bat. Yeah. And they're never not going to be and vicious killers. And maybe homophobic. Paying right. them unjustly right. as homophobic. Well, it goes back to that thing we've discussed where once you've killed one person, you are a murderer forever. Yeah. If you kill somebody at the beginning of the film, even though the film is going backwards chronologically, you're still a murderer. Sure. It's hard to justify that in retrospect. When we follow around protagonists in movies... That's the great part of cinema is we'll believe that they should have done anything. Yep. You know, you follow them around, you see their side of the story, you see why they grew into whatever they did. And then when they make a move like killing someone, or in the real world, you and I as two pacifists would go, oh, never justified. We watch a movie and the movie's basically trying to talk us into it for right. two hours. This movie and going in reverse order starts with the killing and then tries to do the very real world thing of going... No, 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 no. Here's why the why the killing was. No, hold on a second. No, no wait. Let me, let me go back a little further and explain. Yeah. No, you you don't get it. See, we were well. We stole this cab. Well, no, wait. Hold on. Wait, uh, before that, and there's just yeah, no you have justification. to try and get back to a point. And and after you've seen the the skull crushed in, there's yeah. just no talking out yeah. of it. It's this great humanistic point to just go. Yeah, that murder that looked really terrible. These are terrible people. Doesn't matter that in the end. All people have something good to them, and we're going to learn about them and whatever. We just go, murder is wrong, and fuck these two honest, good, uh, cinematically justified people. Fuck them because they did that terrible thing in the beginning. So now imagine that somebody who does a terrible thing at the beginning does it for an hour and a half to a completely innocent human being. The audience, the completely innocent <laughs> poor audience that Lucky McKee tortures. So yeah, this is this is Lucky McKee again. I know that going in, but I don't believe it until there's a girl sitting by the pool reading a book and this kind of lazy alternative music starts yeah. playing. And then I go, oh yeah, it is Lucky McKee. Isn't yeah, it? well, he, he's kind of got that staple of modern music in whatever the hell's going on world, um, which I definitely think plays a part in the reality of this film. Mm. I mean, that first scene plays a huge part. There's a lot that I want to say about this film, sure. but first and foremost, I just want to mention that Lucky McKee, who we covered with May. Yeah. Um, and finally, by the way, comes out with the woman yeah. and has another movie really worthy of being compared sure. to May. Right. Not to say that Lucky McKee's other stuff wasn't cool. Right. I've gone through and seen like pretty much everything yeah. he's done, but because May is so good, right. so fucking good. And you want to have, I mean, we talked for a long time about May. We basically covered it on two goddamn shows, right. you know? Finally, here's another movie that has as much to chew on as that right. one did. Well, and it's written by the same guy who wrote Red, who... Uh, cool. Very cool. Who Lucky McKee... The Lucky know. McKee Red and not the other seven movies right. called Red. Exactly. And also, Lucky McKee did this film, The Woods, which we probably won't cover on the show because at some point I would like to do Suspiria on the show. Right. Lucky right. McKee has a big thing for Dario Argento. Who uh, doesn't they, these days? They, Who doesn't? True. They we touch all on love it. the Argento. They touch on it in May. The biggest thing that I think the two directors have in common, and there's a lot, but the biggest thing is this attention to females. Yeah. Uh, that's Lucky McKee's thing and Dario Argento's thing. And I mean, the film's called The Woman. God damn it. That's our thing, too. I am terrified of this movie from the time it starts. Oh, yeah. I, um, <laughs> I have trouble even, watching even it every time. Even before the pool. Yeah, even yeah. before the pool party. Yes. Although pool parties and that slice of Americana terrifies me just as much. No, I mean, I love that stuff and I love the opening of this film. The shot is just a still river and it's in broad daylight <laughs> and I'm totally uneasy. Why is that? Why am I scared you know, of this? It's just the way it's all put together. You know that something very grave is going to go on. Sure. You see the, the film, scary cover. It's and then something you... with the audacity to give itself such a standard dull title as the woman, you know, <laughs> right. Something real fucked up is going to happen yeah. because the woman isn't about some lady who went to the store and, sure. you know, went to her job. It's something terrible is going to happen to the woman or the woman is going to do something terrible. Or in yeah. this case, both. Yeah. This is called the woman in the way that that, uh, martyrs title card lands. Right. You know what I mean, it's, uh, and this movie wouldn't do that. It would slowly fade in the title card right. because everything is fucking faded and uneasy. It makes my skin crawl. It's a film about graduation. It's a film about the, the slow process that sure. leads to what eventually becomes horrendous. Yeah. It's also called the woman because it doesn't need a fucking title. And although it is, I mean, it's very much about the woman. There's the, the pool scene, which briefly and 
uh, very, very fully allows you to meet every character, know who they are, and then let that be the standing stamp of sure. who that character is. So you can get back to your portrait of the woman. Yeah, You don't exactly. want to deviate from that. Right. You have because this... that's the enigmatic character, right? Yeah. Do well, we it's... care about the other characters? They need they need to be defined in so that by the time they start acting, yeah. you know, by the time the, the ball is actually rolling, you don't ask, why are they doing these things? Sure, you get, sure. You get... Uh, the the one daughter by the pool and she's frumpy and not going in the water so you say to yourself she must be pregnant and then <laughs> the father you, who, you call it the pregnancy early I do yeah I call it the pregnancy when she gives birth <laughs> uh, and then you have the father creepily eyeing her but maybe not creepily eyeing her but you know he's in a power position so yeah. you know he's got some power hang ups because he won't go talk to the neighbor and the wife just allows it and the wife just allows right? it that's her role and then we have the son who you think is going to stop the little girl from being tortured but instead is more fascinated with that than learning to get his free throws in because oh, yep. you got to get your free throws in when you can did you yeah. catch that line no, the father I says to his son you got to get your free throws in when you can son which wow. is just, I mean, that it, that should be tattooed on his fucking arm. Jeez, how I never noticed that. And that's it. Then you know the family. And what they do from that point on is all completely understandable. Sure. And it's all just because of this one little pool party. I don't think we're necessarily ignoring the other characters to study the woman. Maybe I'm just so fascinated with sure. her that that's, you know, well, she that's becomes, how I write that off. She's the object of the other character study. Yeah, the catalyst in that character study. Yeah, exactly. She becomes the rationale for how why we get to watch these characters yeah. unfold because she i mean as much as she's enigmatic she's a blank slate and yeah. not because there's no story behind her but because there's no way for her to tell us that story without bouncing it off these other people because she can't speak she speaks fucking scary language <laughs> i mean you know in that opening scene the camera tilts just a little bit as if uh being bumped by somebody and then this tattered menacing person just emerges it's really the thing i feared would show up yeah you know when you see the opening of this movie and everything's still i'm just thinking in my head wow i have no idea what this movie's about i hope a scary black painted rag person doesn't emerge <laughs> and start speaking gibberish language because that would be about With the, a baby the worst fucking thing that could possibly happen the worst accessory to a human female but she does she just looks inhuman she looks She's covered with black paint. She yeah. is freaky looking when it's in the teeth and the, oh, she needs to God. be power washed to yeah. be clean. I oh, mean, this geez. is the level of grime on this human. Yeah. You know, we don't hear her speak uh, early in the movie either. We just kind of watch her. We're, you know, we're not supposed to be there. That's the part that yeah. really, I think gets to me is once I see her, I know, oh, foreign, bad. This is, you know what, lady, I'm sorry. I walked in on your thing. Right. I'm going to take off. Uh, let's pretend this didn't happen. And isn't that bizarre that the film, you walk in on a feral woman and you feel like you've walked into the bathroom. Yeah, right. Even though she's a human being who's living off, like, living <laughs> yeah, with the right. wolves and killing right. dogs for food. Right. You walk in on her and you back out with your hands up. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't yeah. know this was your cave. Yeah, right. And there's no. There's no. But you need to back out of planet Earth. You right. Know, her. She doesn't have a house. It's right. just everywhere. Well, You're just like, oh, this region, this is you. Sorry about sure. that. I'm going to take That's off. That's the moment of disconnect that I don't get when Chris says, I need to catch her. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Chris right. sees her. Yeah. And first off, he's turned on, which is a little weird. But yeah. he also says, I need to catch her. To me, it's leave that alone and move away. It's the but, rock music, man. That's why. <laughs> yeah. But, but the normal human reaction really is this woman needs to be helped. Sure. Not necessarily the way sure. Chris quote helps her yeah but you see a human being like that and you definitely believe that she's i mean even if she's insane mm -hmm. she's probably a danger to at least herself yeah he's out hunting and he makes that decision to bring her back a kind of decision that i feel like and maybe this is what you're alluding to it's almost the right I mean, it's, she needs, yeah, she needs it's the help. right you're decision, right. but it feels like the absolute wrong decision. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't make that decision. Yeah. I'd be terrified. I'm scared of that person. I would go I home can't. and not tell my family, but yeah, I would also right. tell my daughters they're not allowed to leave the house ever again. Again, for a different reason than Chris right. would tell his daughters that. Chris brings uh, the woman home and he restrains her, ties her up in the basement because uh -huh. that's how you help her. And uh, she bites his finger off. Yeah. Awesome. And man, is he grumpy about it. Yeah, he's not happy. She looks so fucking boss she when does. she bites that finger off. And this is a weird moment for me because I'm terrified, but I also love powerful women. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I want to root for her and I want to be excited and go, yeah, you bite his finger off. He's an asshole. 
but I also don't want to look at her because I'm afraid right. if I make eye contact, she'll attack me. Well, and that brings me to a to an interesting point that the film kind of deals with right there in that moment. Mm-hmm. And and furthermore, I mean, it becomes one of the major themes of the film. But we get this weird juxtaposition where we just talked about irreversible and we talked about kind of bad people. Yeah. In this film, it's very clear who the bad people are. Definitively no question who the worst person is, who the second worst person is, and how to bullet list all the way down. Sure. The one person who never feels like a bad person is the most violent one. Yeah, right, right. And it's kind of this thing that we've never talked about on Double Feature, where as much as we hate violence, violence doesn't make you a bad person. Sure. It's the intent of the violence. Yeah, that's true. And we have this, I mean, she's feral. She's not operating with human faculties. Right. That's absolutely safe to say we're sure. not belittling her as a human being or saying you well, know they show the wolf in the beginning i mean they're setting up that imagery right and she's operating on instinct and fear mm-hmm. and so her violence isn't with this moralistic rationale to hurt another human right. being or stand her ground whereas chris is doing these awful things and he is doing right. it for power and with malicious evil intention sure while she's a hundred percent more violent and still the better person yeah which is this wonderful juxtaposition that the film constantly plays with is the violence always happening to from by way of the good character. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess when I always say violence is never justified on this show, there is a point where, I mean, if you a need bear, it, you can't fault yeah. a bear for being a bear, a snake <laughs> sure. uh, back to way back to natural born killers. Yeah. Snake go be a snake. Yeah, but you got to be careful with that, though. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, you know, anybody who does bad things has a reason for yeah. doing them. And that is rarely, I'm evil. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Chris's it's case, really clearly cut that way. Yeah, Chris isn't even necessarily evil so much as a, a dick. and He's uh, horrible. He's a terrible person. He's driven by power and he's yeah. a chauvinistic guy. I always, uh, when I talk to people about double feature and I say, man, we have these conversations that out of context make me sound like a bad person. Yeah. And they go, like, what? I'm like, well, when we talked about how Nazis aren't evil, they just right. make really bad choices sure. or we, on the I Tank mean, Girl show. No yeah, less. we've also had conversations about, you know, why it's actually okay to have incest I'm and sure. masturbating to kids. Is that really a problem? <laughs> right. Ah, uh, double feature. Cannot go on your resume. You know what I'm talking about, though. There's, uh, there's really nobody born with evil. I mean, that's just kind of my opinion. Sure. Well, it's our opinion. It's double features opinion. It's our stance. No one's born evil. People just make decisions. Sometimes they're the some worst are born villain. Ever. Born, yeah, that's for another show. Born fucking villain. Sorry. And so to get back to your point, is she maybe kind of justified because someone's attacking her? She. I mean, I don't want to say she doesn't know any better because that's not an excuse to be violent in right. and of itself. But at this point, she doesn't know at all. She knows nothing. Yeah. She is an animal, and she is caged and cornered and fucked with. She's committing these acts of violence. She wants to get out. She wants her freedom. She may have no other choice. Yet because you fear her, Lucky keeps playing with that balance of who do you identify with, sure. who's the protagonist. If Lucky pushed harder to really get us behind the woman, we would say, oh, yeah, totally justified. Right. You know, She'd become a hero. She would. She would become a hero. But there's that language barrier that keeps us separate. There's uh, even just the way he shoots the movie. Yeah. You know, we're behind Chris. Sure. It puts us in this really uncomfortable place of aligning with Chris just because that's how it's shot. Right. And when she snaps, she snaps at us. She snaps directly at the center of the camera. Right. As if we did something something wrong. Well, and that's kind of that's kind of the weird disconnect of the film too, is that even though I disagree with Chris on every fundamental level, mm-hmm. I identify with him more than somebody who's barely human. Right. You are forced to identify with the bad guy yeah. in this film. That's because I mean, you're presented with the question of is she even human? Sure. By species, by DNA, she is classifiably a human being. Yeah. And that that's where it's not ends. enough. It's not yeah. enough. To, to identify with her, even though she's at the basis level the same as you or I, the one we get, the one that we can connect to, is this guy who will beat his wife for yep. getting out of line. Yeah. And that's why this film puts you in a dark place the whole way through. Yeah, we want her to be the protagonist, and we want to align with her, and she will not let us. The mm-hmm. movie will not let us, almost to the point of guilt. Yeah. It will not let us. We feel like... Uh, I mean, if anybody ever challenges this as not being a feministic movie, sure. it's because it's impossible to look at it from her viewpoint yeah, unless right. you're so far detached. Because the movie just keeps saying, 
oh, you're Chris and you're going down there to, you know, you don't see the woman when people aren't down there fucking right. with her, you know, and she snaps and she challenges the audience directly. She wants you. She's having that argument with you because you're part of humanity the same way Chris is part right, of humanity. Exactly. And she's part of feral community. Uh huh. Well, and furthermore, I'm a boy and this film doesn't make boys feel very good about themselves. Well, yeah, at the very least, it'll force us towards the other female characters. Yeah. It forces us towards Peggy and towards Belle. And, you know, we can identify more in them because uh, they're, you know, they're enabling Chris because they have no other choice. Sure. They're kind of, they're almost held captive if you yeah. really want to be sympathetic Once with them. Once you see the level of heinous abuse that Chris is capable of, especially at the end when we get to the barn, mm. you understand that these aren't necessarily weak women, they're trapped women. Yeah. And, I mean, their lives are absolutely analogous to the woman being chained in the basement. Sure. The woman could get out. If she were willing to do some seriously horrible things. Yeah. The basic difference between the woman in the basement and Peggy and all of them is that they are human beings and they have this moralistic boundary of not eating their husband's face off. Sure. And so they're not willing to do that. They're not willing to chop their own son in half because he's a bad person. Yeah, right. Even though all the men in this film are horrible. Even do you remember the the teacher who like kind of gets hot for Jean Viev? Sure, sure. All the men in this film are perverted. Yeah. And I don't think that that's a blanket statement about society. I think it's kind of a motion that the film is making. Is well, that, it's also shaming the sex out of you. Yeah, you know? it is. Well, and it's it's just, I think it's it's kind of used to show how depravity forces women into these weird situations. Yeah, I mean, the that sexual exchange they kind of have, the conversation they have mm -hmm. uh, behind the bleachers, which is the best place, by the way, to have a sexual exchange is uh the most human sexuality in the whole movie yeah it Just really at is at least by comparison sure. that should be the thing we latch on to yeah. as well it's a little weird and creepy but at least it's consensual it's consensual and it's conversational and it's understandable and clearly these two people have a relationship where that's okay yeah you can build a relationship where what would in some situations be sexually offensive right can be absolutely fine and that's, it's a strong moment that the film has in 30 seconds. You see they're comfortable with it, but you're uncomfortable because you've been shamed. Exactly. Because all of your exposure to sex in this movie is, you know, you see the woman naked. You see that over and over. Yeah. And they're washing her and fucking changing her. It's all sterile. It's all cold and detached. And, you know, that's the way that the film shames you for it. It makes it seem like in these people's world, they don't have sex. Nudity is just, a, I mean, they don't even think about it. Right. And that's why, you know, you get the um, the conversation at the school and it feels like, oh, these people are talking about sex for pleasure so as something to enjoy. Sure. That's not how the weird 50s Amish world. Thing, right. That's not sure. how you talk about sex there. So, you know, when they come back to that and Chris sneaks off in the middle of the night then suddenly this feels way wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wrong enough to capture a woman, lock her up in the basement against her will, torture her, and rape her. That's pretty bad, yeah. Yeah, already pretty bad, right? <laughs> but in the in the bobcat method of make things even fucking worse, now we have these people who they don't even talk about sex. They don't mention sex, and if you were to bring up sex with them, they would... It's unspoken and uncomfortable. That's, yep. why, that's why she can't tell her father she's pregnant. Sure. Because, I mean, that conversation with Jean Viev is horrifying. Yeah. Where he says she doesn't have a boyfriend. Yeah. Are you accusing my son of having sex with sure, her? You're accusing sure. me? Because sex doesn't happen. It's yeah. not just a thing people do. Mm -hmm. It's something, I mean, almost utilitarian. Yeah. It's something between a familiar man and woman. It's not done necessarily for pleasure. Sure. Except if you're the god of your household. Yeah. That is when sex becomes pleasurable and something you can take advantage of. And it's just this, you're right, the kind of Amish 1950s, we don't talk about sex because sex isn't a thing that people do, leads you to just fear it and be uncomfortable with it. And when it comes up in the film, you feel the same way that Angela Bettis' character does, where you just, you want to go to sleep. Yep. You want to cry yourself to sleep uh -huh. and pretend that in the morning it never happened. Right before Jean Viev comes into their house, uh, she finally says, you know, I've had enough. And she's even more, I think, addressing the emotion of it than yeah. the... She's just overwhelmed by yeah. how long this has gone on. And she knows it's wrong, but she kind of lets it go. And now it's become too much for her. Not because of something specifically that 
has happened to the woman, but how Chris then reacted to that conversation. Sure. She saw what happened to the woman. She was still willing to talk to Chris, talk things over with Chris. And, you know, that's the, the first acknowledgement that this is kind of terrible. But Genevieve is really the, that's the character I identify with. That's the normal person entering, you know, what has become a dangerous bubble of a, yeah. a little community here. Mm -hmm. The not talking to people outside your bubble is the reason that this mentality kind of exists for them. We get the feeling watching this movie that it's set in the 1950s and it's kind of this, you know, I used the, the word Amish or whatever, but you know what I mean. It's sure. a secluded community, right. yeah, this it's... family that lives away from society, yeah, not on their, their own. ideals. And you get that because, not because it's in the 1950s, because it's fucking not in the... No, listen to the music. They have That's a, what I think the strength of the music is, is yeah. that it reminds you this is happening in yep. the same world you live in. Yeah. Do you recognize this song? That's sure. because it's happening in the world you live in. Doesn't that make it worse? The party, the school, their car, the laptop mm -hmm. at his law office. Yeah. I mean, it's all modern stuff. It's just we retreat to this cabin and this a place yeah. where a woman could be chained in the basement. We're trapped in a previous fucking era, not unlike the woman is trapped in right. the basement. It's our one little way of identifying with her is going, well, we don't want to be here either. We're stuck with these characters just as much as you are. So her teacher is faced with this moral dilemma of, you know, do I tell the parents or not about what's going on? And she finally makes, uh, I mean, by comparison to the other decisions in this movie, anything is a right decision. But she goes, all right, I think I need to intervene, which is probably the right decision in her. I, I mean, I don't know. Who cares? Not uh -huh. so far beyond the point of the other things that are going on. Right. Bear or no bear, more important stuff is happening. And she shows up and she basically gets punched out. I mean, Angela Bettis gets punched out. Yeah. She's literally, she gets punched. But, um, you know, she's assaulted. First of all, she's overwhelmed by the sudden shift in... Do you think my mood. son yeah. rapes? Do you think sure. I did it? Well, how quickly the conclusion goes from your daughter is pregnant to are you accusing me right. of incest? You know, what's funny, though, is that sudden bizarre logic by this point just seems natural to me. Not to me. Really? To me, it's terrifying. It is terrifying, me, but I, I feel this... like I've been in their home so long. And after the conversation they just had, when he jumps to that point, I just go, yep, that's a thing he would See, say, wouldn't he? To me, how it feels is we have this outside force coming in. Mm -hmm. It's this fresh air moving into a very stale bubble. Sure, sure. And you think, okay, this is finally going to start evening out. There's, you know, there's a breeze you think here. they might the right. jig might be up at this point but instead, instead yeah. I, the bubble closes behind the air and it just <laughs> right. gets consumed and that's terrifying to me because i realize how powerful the world inside the bubble really is is it's not that things haven't gotten in it's that it can maintain itself sure. despite sure. the real world a world that uh and i don't even know if we talked about you know one of the most kind of enigmatic components of that is that this whole situation seems pretty fucked up, pretty bizarre. Yep. And then we find out it might have been bizarre a little bit before the woman even showed up. Yeah, a lot before. Because So uh, we get these the reference of the dogs, Yeah, right? What's going on out there with the dogs alone would be enough to get you disbarred. Yeah, right. That's exactly it. You know, the I think there's two references to the dogs previous to when we kind of find out uh, before Belle takes a stand and Chris punches her for it. But when we get down there, there is another woman. Yeah. And that woman attacks uh, Jean Viev. The character in the dog pen's name is Socket, but Chris uses the phrase anephthalma and then eventually finally says anephthalmia, which is a, it's an eye disease. Yeah. Uh, anephthalmia is. But I remember watching the film the first time and thinking he, he said ant ophthalma. That's also pretty fucked up. The reason it makes sense to me in that sense, because I think they refer to her as one of the sisters later on, but that to me... It's another reason why you don't stand up to Chris. Yeah. You end up with no eyes locked up with the dogs. So this is, uh, it's really hard to digest when you first get in there because already things are heating up. We just fucking caveman beat and drug the teacher. The woman uh, is out. Down in the basement. Yeah, the woman's out. So, you know, there's just so much going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hell breaking loose. When Peggy goes down there and frees the woman and then her teacher is being fucking eaten alive in the dog state. I, I have a hard time even recollecting all sure. of the events that are going on at once. But there is this sort of slow motion about to kick ass and save the day sort of thing that happens with a woman 
where Peggy frees her, you see her teacher being mauled, and you first put together that, oh my God, there's a, another person over there that's eating her. Right. So the woman is going to be the hero and she's going to go save the day. And this is when, uh, this is when we can finally get behind that character. And instead, the first one she fucking attacks is Belle. Yeah. She goes outside the house and you know, it's called the woman and I'm latching on to the female figures. So the first time I, and I remember this so much every time I watch it after, but the first time I saw it, I'm thinking, all right, so that's kind of what her deal is. She identifies with the other female characters. She realizes that they're all trapped here and she's going to fucking save them all and murder Chris. And I don't know, maybe spit on the kid because you don't kill kids in movies. Uh And she goes out and she kills Belle. And now I have no fucking idea what's going on. (laughs) I have no concept of what's happening. There's a dog woman. The teacher's being eaten. The woman is killing everyone. I just don't know what her... I I can't latch on to any concept of of what's going on in the movie. And it's this great moment that gives you that irreversible style of disorientation. I kind of wonder even now that all is said and done, the dust has settled, looking back at it, does she attack Belle? I mean, is the movie showing that just to prove we don't get her? Or are we maybe jaded by the narrative and we shouldn't feel for bell she's a terrible person i mean the woman attacks her what's that i think about? it's just that i mean you freed this character and you're so this is the moment where the film could let the woman be the hero and let you finally identify with the person you've been longing to be on the side sure. of and the first thing she does is relentlessly slaughter this person that you were that really hoping attacked. would be okay yeah the the person that you feel like has been through the most shit sure That the movie just made us feel for moments ago. Immediately, you're taken away from identifying with the woman and you're back. At this point, you have trouble identifying with anybody. Maybe Peggy, right? Of the people who aren't eaten, especially. Right. I think that's... You have to pick a character who hasn't been eaten. I think that's why at the end of the film, it winds up, you know, the way it does where she she becomes the more human one. Sure. She looks at Peggy like, what the hell are you even doing? Sure. I'm taking that. Yeah, right. That's mine. I have to take your kid. Do so, not raise that the way you are. Well, and so that's after killing Chris and killing the kid. Yeah. You know, killing his Chopping son. Chopping him in half. But she also goes and she feeds the the woman with no eyes. Right. It's this moment where, yeah, she looks more human, especially by comparison. These are two very different creatures. Right. They were both trapped in the basement, and we started this conversation talking about the woman as the feral woman. She's no longer the feral woman. No. She's now the real person, and the feral woman is the fucking dog woman right. who, again, thought it couldn't get any worse. Look at the, the situation. That's it. That's how we thought about that first character. Yeah, exactly. When she came into the movie, and now, oh, that's totally a human being, and it's the other crazy woman who's in the even, the even worse spot. So I don't know, just the final moments of that movie uh, defies any, I, I thought I knew where it's going. I didn't. I'm so pleasantly surprised by that. I mean, I should yeah. go out of my way to say that is a way, way, way good thing. A uh, huge strength of the film that, oh, you kind of maybe think you have a handle on things and nope, no idea. Just hates the family that imprisoned her, yep. taking your daughter. I'm out of here. Uh, this gets a little more complicated. Yeah. Well, so you had told me this right before we started recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, occasionally, we like to just freak each other out yeah, about doing these shows. Yeah, that's part of the game. So one, there's a thing after the credits. Yeah. And if I you... didn't tell you this. You told me this. No, I told this you this. This was your attempt to freak me out, and my retort was the other thing. It's a short little piece at the very end with the daughter and kind of... Um, well, just watch it. There's a thing after yeah. the credits, and it's long, and it's a bigger deal than most things that are after the credits right. of movies. It's it's better than shawarma. Nothing's better than shawarma. Uh, the previous film. Yeah. There's a previous film? Yeah. So what? the woman, the character, there's a film called Offspring, which is also written by Jack Ketchum, who wrote The Woman and sure. Red, and he also wrote The Girl Next Door. Wrote The a, Woman with Lucky McKee. Right. I mean, he's a big, he's yeah. a big horror writer. Offspring is this film about, you know, some families that go to Maine and it basically explains how this woman ends up feral and how she ends up in the wilderness. And I'm not going to spoil it because I think it's on Netflix. And if you're looking for it, you can probably find it. I watched it as a prequel. You know, I I watched the woman first. Well, that's because no one knows what the fuck this is. Well, it's not even, it's barely online. You really have to look. Well, you mentioned this to me and I did a quick Google thing before our show because that's what I do when I have a panic attack Uh is I go on Google. Uh, Google does not know that this is a <laughs> that this is a sequel. So I haven't talked to anybody about the woman who said, "Oh yeah, did you see Offspring. that first movie?" Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. 
isn't it the same actor who's in it too? Yeah, it's the same. The same actor plays the woman. In addition to Offspring, we have other movies to watch. Uh, you can go to doublefeatureshow.com where we'll link to something interesting. Next time on the show, we're going to delve deeply into children's cinema. Mm-hmm. We're going to do Spy Kids. Yeah. And uh, we're going to pair that with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is a Stuart Gordon film. Ah, so we have some people who shouldn't be making kids films that are making some goddamn kids films. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.